Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Daniel Naroditsky. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be joining you on this webinar. Uh, first things first, I'd like a little bit of confirmation that, um, that I can be heard and that I can be seen. So if somebody could just type in the chat uh, whether the audio is working fine, that would really help me. Thank you. Sanchez, can you hear me fine? Hi, I've been just one, if one person could tell me if they can hear me, uh, that would be very helpful indeed. Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, so yes, you guys can hear me, very good. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, just give me a moment here. Okay. I'm just trying to exit out of the, yeah, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> just give me a second. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Um, in this webinar, I'm going to be continuing on with the theme that Sam and I covered in our, um, in our last two webinars uh, yesterday and the day before, which is uh, kind of giving you guys a sneak preview of the Naroditsky method and the Shanklin method. Both of them are 15 hour courses. Um, that came out a couple of months back. And now iChess is offering them in a really, really good sale. Uh, both of them are, are normally worth $120 each, but iChess is offering a deal whereby you can purchase a bundle, both the Naroditsky method and the Shanklin method, um, both for $79. Now the sale is only available for the next eight hours. So I would highly encourage you to consider purchasing it. I'm gonna give a link below uh, for your pleasure and edification. Um, I'm going to be talking about it throughout this webinar. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. Basically, uh, Sam left yesterday for a tournament in North Carolina. He's going to be playing uh, the US Masters, so it's just me. And I'll spend most of the time giving you guys a sneak preview of the Naroditsky method, telling you guys what it's all about. And um, hopefully, I'm going to convince you that it's um, really worth purchasing and worth taking a look at. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to share my chess-based screen, and we're going to get all started. So here we go. All right. Yeah. OK. So let's get started. Um, what I'd like to do is show a couple of games that appear in the Naroditsky method and I'd like, I'd like to talk about them and basically talk about the theme that I'll be covering. And again, uh, I don't like to peddle my products in general, but hopefully this webinar alone will be a good instructive experience for you guys. And hopefully you'll like the style that I have when I'm teaching. And um, by the end, I'll talk a little bit more about both the Naroditsky method and the Shankler method. So what is the Naroditsky method really all about? Um, basically, my what was my inspiration? Well, most of my inspiration came from seeing a lot of players with whom I'd worked and, you know, whom I coached and who I played with who had kind of recurring questions and doubts about their own chess improvement. A lot of players who came to me and with whom I worked asked me, you know, how can I improve X? How can I improve Y? How can I improve Z? And so as I gained more experience in terms of coaching and working with players, I began to realize that there's a whole lot of concepts in chess that are not very well covered in chess literature and that are not very easy to improve. And so what these 15 hours of the Naroditsky method are all about is taking concepts that are not easy to study, that have not received the coverage that they deserve in chess literature, and fleshing them out and helping the dedicated and ambitious chess player actually improve all of these critically important but poorly covered chess skills. Now I cover a very wide uh, breadth. I talk about positional concepts, things like choosing an opening repertoire, how to memorize an opening, how to study openings, everything about positional chess that you would ever want to know, um, things like piece placement and maneuvering, things like intuition. And another thing that I focus on is calculation. Now, one might argue that calculation has, in fact, received um, quite a bit of coverage in chess literature, and really it has. But I firmly believe that the tips and methods that I present on my chapters in calculation and the Naroditsky method really go a mile beyond what is normally spoken of. So 
one thing that I'd like to start with is by asking you guys uh, in the audience, when you hear the word calculation, um, what are some of the concepts that normally come to mind? So what do you associate with calculations? What sorts of mechanisms and tips and, and things do you do when you hear that word calculation? So just throw some words out there. All right, I'm gonna and also bear with me for, for one second. I'm gonna pull up the, uh, the chat on my phone so that I can actually see what you guys are saying. All right, let's see here. So the question that I'm asking once again is, what do you associate calculation with? Like, what is calculation all about? Yeah, give me right about one minute to uh, get the chat working. All right. Yeah, just bear with me for another 30 seconds. I'm pulling the video up on my phone so I can see the chat. Hmm. Let's see here. Okay. Um, yeah, how do I minimize this? Ugh. Okay, so I'm seeing evaluate the position, being able to visualize what would happen many moves ahead, candidate moves, a couple of candidate moves, excellent. Find the best, find as deepest as you can. Everything is absolutely correct. How to study chess books. Okay, I guess that doesn't quite have to do with calculation. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Things like candidate moves and looking deep, calculating three or four moves ahead or more, general things like that. But really what I came to realize throughout my, 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 um, my, my chess career is that there's a lot more to calculation, especially to becoming good at calculation than that. A lot of the stuff that we're taught at is this set mechanism that first you come up with like five or six candidate moves then you calculate them out, and then you try to evaluate them, and then magically you come up with which move is correct, and then you execute it on the board. But my point is that it's not that easy. And in the realm of calculations, there's a couple of very subtle tools that you need to add to your arsenal in order to maximize your success in terms of calculation. So a couple of them are what I'd like to present using this game. So what you see in front of you is one of my games uh, from last year. I was playing the white pieces against a grandmaster from the Czech Republic, Viktor Lesnička. Um, he was rated, I think, 2660 at uh, the time this game was played. And um, I didn't play the opening particularly well. As you can probably see, I lost a pawn. And we reached this very, very complicated position. So first things first, uh, I'd like to give you guys a couple of minutes uh, to really look at this position, soak it in, and try to calculate as much as you can. Try to come up with the correct sequence for white. Now understand that white is up down a pawn. So if I don't do anything, black is going to consolidate and he's going to be clearly better. So I could feel that sense of urgency. I could feel that if I didn't do something now, I'd probably lose the game. But really try to soak it in and go as deeply as possible. And um, I'll be silent for about a minute or so, letting you guys really calculate and go as deeply as possible into the position. White to move, try to find the correct sequence. All right, I'll give you guys 30 more seconds before I start examining various um, possibilities. <clears throat> Okay, I see swipey cool, bishop takes f5. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And that's actually the first move that starts off the combination. It's bishop takes f5. Um, 
Tom Smith also suggests Bishop B1, um, which is a thought. I mean, basically, you're trying to get, you're trying to exploit the C file. And I guess I've, I've jumped the gun a little bit here. What's, what's the general point here? The general point is the C file is Black's only deficiencies. Pieces are incredibly well placed. So if I don't somehow exploit the only deficiency in Black's position, I'm going to be in trouble. There's a couple of ways to do that. Tom Smith suggests a bishop b1, again, which is a thought. The problem with this is I can simply play queen d8. And if you gobble up my knight, then there's this checkmating combination, rook d1. And because of this bishop on b7, um, white's weak back rank shines through. Um, so bishop b1 doesn't quite work. Uh, I guess bishop b3 is another thought, but you're not creating enough threats. I can make a move like queen c7, chase that knight back, but um, I'm still going to be up a pawn. And after you play like knight f3, I can make a move like queen d6, and the underlying problem has not been resolved. White is still down upon for dubious compensation. Bishop takes f5. Yeah, so Rui Zhang Wang, you're exactly right. The point is this. He takes f5 is obviously absolutely forced, and now you make the move knight d3. And now things are a little bit different, because number one, you've reclaimed the pawn. Okay, that's a start. And number two, that knight on c5 is pinned, and it is under attack. The bishop on e7 is also under attack. So if white recovers the piece, then I've recovered the pawn, and my pieces are still pretty well placed, so I figured that I'd be okay. But the first kind of major concept that I really hammer home in the Naroditsky method, and I mentioned this a lot, I realize that it, it can get pretty old when you're listening to me harping on this again and again and again, but I really cannot emphasize this enough. Stopping prematurely is what I believe to be one of the biggest problems that people um, that people have and people experience when calculating complicated lines. I think that a lot of you in the audience, you have different chess ratings, you're at different points in your chess career, but I think that calculation is not inherently difficult. What it consists of is hard work and finding continuations and just forcing yourself to go further and further. But one thing that a lot of chess players do consistently is that they'll find a nice idea. They'll calculate maybe two or three moves ahead. They'll look at that resulting position and say, yeah, that looks kind of good. But it's the mark of an incredibly strong and experienced player to always force himself to go one step deeper. And that's something that I really talk about in the narrative method. You need to go one step deeper and to force yourself to calculate a little bit further, even when it seems like the line should be over, because that is going to pay dividends both in terms of finding resources for your opponent and thereby refuting wrong lines, but most importantly, finding resource, resources for yourself, even when the line seems to have been refuted. So with that said, after knight d3, what can black do in order to kind of continue muddying the waters here? There's two moves that I'm looking for. What can you guys suggest here? Anandu a, nice. That is not a chess move, so I am a little bit skeptical. Swipey cool. The main problem is time trouble. Another non-chess move. I'm looking for chess moves here. What candidate moves does black have in this position? Rujong Wang, excellent. Rook takes d3, e takes d3, queen c6 is absolutely one of them exploiting the huge weakness that white has along this diagonal. What else does black have? Well, rook e5 immediately I can take with my knight. So, and there's no queen c6 here. So this is not quite um, a possibility. There's one more move that I'm looking for, which is very similar to what was just suggested. So rook takes c3 is one execution, but what else can black do? Uh, knight takes c3, I'll grab that queen on c8 with check. F4 is a thought, um, but what happens if I just take the bishop? Remember that the knight is not the only piece that's hanging. Yeah, Rujang Wang, very good. Queen c6. So black is trying to exploit this weakness along the diagonal. And it's very, very important to treat your opponent's candidate moves with as much respect as you treat your own. Um, so let's tackle this line. F4, queen takes e7, queen h3. Then I have this nice thing called checkmate with queen e8. So it doesn't quite work. You're trying to use the right idea, but there's a more direct way of doing that, and that's queen c6 or rook takes d3. So rook takes d3 is not particularly difficult to refute. 
And here's where I'd like to make a little bit of a break to talk about another concept that's very important. And that is not assuming anything when you're calculating, okay? Psychologically, when you look at a certain move like rook takes d3, there is a massive temptation to assume that e takes d3 is forced. That's how our brains work. We, our brains right, try to not waste time looking at extraneous options. But chess is such a complex game that at any point, assuming that something is forced or assuming that something is easy to calculate when it's not can really cost you the game. And this is exactly one of those situations. Why is e takes d3 not forced? So what is what is um, what else does White have in this position other than he takes d3? Queen can take. Yeah, exactly. So I'm assuming you mean queen can take the bishop, which is exactly what I was planning. And the knight is spins. Yeah. So simply simply queen takes c7. Um, rook takes c5 in this position doesn't work because of that same background thing with rook d1 with uh, checkmating threats. But queen takes e 7 absolutely works. And here's the point. After e takes d3, the reason this is bad is after queen c6, f3, the knight is still pinned, but black has a very powerful move, bishop g5. Now, this, this leads to very, very big complications. Um, suffice it to say that I think that black should be able to evade the checks. But in any case, this is completely unnecessary calculation, because after queen takes e7, the game is simply drawn. Um, black can try queen c6, and how is white going to parry the checkmate here? There's a mate threat along the long diagonal. What can White do about it? So yeah, Jaden Zhu, you're right. Um, e4 has the right intention, but after queen takes e4, you're going to be losing a piece because you've uh, tackled the symptoms but not the cause. I'm still threatening checkmate. You have to take my queen. And if you count up the pieces, I have a bishop and a knight against the bishop. So that's not quite right, but f3 absolutely is. Black is at a complete standstill in terms of his attack along the long diagonal. He can't stubbornly crash through because of queen e8 checkmate. How about them apples? Look whose back rank is weaker. Ha, ha, ha. What he can do is a move like um, rook d5, basically just bailing out, or a move like queen d7, leading to an equal end game after queen takes d7, uh, rook takes d7, bishop takes c5. Okay? Um, yeah, so vk, you're absolutely right. f3 leads to mate. So that's a very important thing to establish. Black cannot take an f3. He has to bail out and draw. So rook takes d3 is dealt with. But the really difficult move here is, um, is queen c6, OK? So what does white do here? Let's see some suggestions. What is kind of the first move that you should be calculating here based on general principles? Very good. F3 is one option. Um, but in terms of efficiency of calculation, what should you start with? Uh, bishop takes c5 actually does not work because you're not dealing with a weakness along the long diagonal. I can play rook takes d3 and you're completely busted. Uh, 95, exactly the same thing. You need to be treating the underlying cause. Just rook takes e 5 Same thing with knight takes e 5 Guys, you need to be careful because it's the same thing that's targeting you each and every time. It's the long diagonal. So f3 is absolutely one of the candidate moves. But there's a more obvious move that you should be at least naming here, that you should be calculating. Yeah, so now queen takes e7. And the reason you should be calculating is because it's simply it's a capture. Um, the line rook takes d3, f3, if you look at it closely, it's exactly transposes to the previous line. We've already calculated that. We've already done that work. So rook takes d3, we've established is fine for black, uh, for white. And that's actually what happened in the game. But when I was calculating this move, queen takes e7, there's another move that I saw which almost made me reject this line. What is this move that black has which looks incredibly nasty here? Mm. 
<clears throat> what can black do here? Very good, rookie five. And um, classic exploitation of the diagonal. Um, same, th same thing we've just seen quite a few times. And it looks like white is completely busted, okay? Because I can either take the rook, and um, as Yasser Sero, a very famous chess commentator, his friend um, Nikolai Minov, like to say, uh, he recently passed away, very strong international master. Uh, white will die, but at least he'll die with a full stomach. Uh, but we don't want to die, which would not be good. Um, so queen takes e5 is not possible. And if you defend against checkmate, then um, you lose the queen. So not a very pleasant option. If you give a check on d8, it doesn't change anything after rook e8 because, um, because uh, you still lose the queen and there's still this double attack. But what I did here when I was calculating this line is reminded myself of this principle that very few people, I think, consciously remind themselves of often, which is do not stop. Don't simply give up on calculation at the first sign of an obstacle. And so I forced myself to spend 15 to 30 seconds in this position just looking at it and making sure that I wasn't missing any resources, that I wasn't stopping prematurely. And lo and behold, because I forced my brain to go through that extra process, I was able to take this calculation to the next step, and I found a really, really strong move in this position. Now, one of you guys has already found this move, but I'd like to see a couple of you name that move, just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Queen takes b7 would still give up the queen. It would probably be the best way to do so, but you'd still be down some material. It's not queen takes b7. Uh, e4, I'll take that queen. Thank you very much. Dan Bujor, very good. And Norbert Og, very good. Queen f7. I've seen two of them already, so time to, time to do the big reveal. Yeah, swipey cool, also very good. Just a fantastic move. And you know, guys, like when I'm sure you guys can all relate to me. When you're when you're calculating and you see a move like this and it saves the line, the euphoria is incredible. That's just why I play chess. I, I saw this move, I wanted to go run and hug the wall. Um, okay, that's not quite what I wanted to do, but I like to exaggerate things a little bit. Queen F7 check, brilliant tactical response. If King H8, then I checkmate you. And if King takes F7, the queen has gone off for the greater good. Knight takes e5 with a fork. Now I'm going to pick up the queen, pick up the knight, and I'm just up a rook for nothing, winning the game. So a move like queen f7, you might look at it in a puzzle and say, yeah, gee, I mean, nice move, but nothing extraordinary. But when you go through that extra step of calculation and you really force yourself to go one step further, these are the kinds of moves that you can discover during the game. Okay, so that is one of the points that I really try to make in the Arditsky method. All of you who are watching this video right now are capable of finding this move. But there's a big difference between actually seeing a move and then looking for it. In order to see this kind of move, you need to be looking for it. And in order to be looking for it, you need to be aware of the natural human's tendency to stop too soon when you're calculating a line. So queen f7 wins the game. And so my opponent almost played rook e5, but he saw it, he played rook takes d3. I responded with a move f3, and I actually was able to win the game because I think he was expecting to be better in some position, and he wasn't able to reorient, reorient himself to the defense psychologically. Great move, Arthur Norowski. Thank you. Yeah, well, didn't get a chance to execute it, but what happened was we bailed out into this end game, king f2. Now, in addition to the fact that black has no more attack, I'm also double attacking. What exactly are my two threats here? What is white threatening in this position? Mate in one with queen f8 mate, very good. And what's the second lesser threat here? Queen f8 and queen takes f5, very good. So classic double attack, you're forcing black to give up a pawn. He played h6. But rather than just taking the pawn immediately, which would have allowed black actually to win my bishop with queen d4, I made a more savvy execution and won the pawn with tempo. What can I do here? What can I do here to capture on f5 without preferably losing the game? <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people suggest queen f8 mate. Um, it's probably because uh, following the chat on my phone, there might be like a five second lag. So the question once again is, what do I do after h6? Check and then queen f5. Very good. Good tactical eye. Queen f8 check. Queen takes f5 check. Winning a pawn. Now, black has still very good drawing chances here. My opponent lost the game in the end. I'm not going to show the remainder of the game right now because we got bigger fish to fry. Also, 
if you do get the Narodinsky method, um, I'm proud to say that I do show the remainder of the game there. Um, so uh, once again, to remind those of you who may have joined us a little bit later, um, the re you know the reason I'm doing this webinar is because I love chess and I love teaching. But the less uh, generous reason I'm doing this webinar is to advertise a really really nice bundle that iChess has made available uh, for the Naroditsky method and the Sam Shanklin method, which was produced by my good friend and the very very strong grandmaster Sam Shanklin. So the normal price of each is $120, but iChess is offering a bundle whereby you can buy both the Naroditsky method and the Shanklin method. That's 30 hours of instruction for just $79. And I really sound like Billy Mays right now or some other kitschy commercial salesman, but it really, really is a good deal. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end. But for now, I'd like to continue with this theme of calculation that I tackle in a lot more length than uh, the Naroditsky method. And we're going to switch on to the next game. Um, so one thing to, to switch topics for uh, just, just a couple of seconds, uh, the Shanklin method deals very extensively um, with a topic that I think is very, very important for players of all levels. And Sam is not here with me, and hopefully he'll forgive me for, for speaking on his behalf. Um, but one of the main topics in the Shanklin method is this, this concept of using calculation in order to further positional goals. So let's say that you're looking in a position, you're like, gee, I really want to play X, Y, Z here. I really want to move my queen to G6, but I cannot quite make that happen because my opponent has such and such resource. How do you harness your calculational ability in order to make positional things happen? That is one of the main overarching themes of Grandmaster Sam Shanklin's method, another 15 hours of instruction. And in my opinion, that's an incredibly important concept. It's so important that I myself have the Shanklin method on my bucket list. So as soon as I'm done with this webinar, I'm going to watch it for 15 hours straight. OK, not quite going to do that, but definitely something that you might, might, might want to consider. Um, by the way, I see a couple of uh, questions trickling in. I'll, I'll finish this webinar like at uh, my time is uh, 2 two thirty right now. So I'll finish about five minutes before the hour, and I'll give you guys plenty of time to ask as many questions as you need, OK? So if you have questions, just stand them up. Um, the next game that I'd like to examine builds on this concept of using calculation to further positional goals. This also appears in the Naroditsky method um, under the chapter called Unspoken Rules of Positional Chess which is a bit of an enigmatic title. In order to find more about it, you're just going to have to watch the Naradisky method. But in this game, I'd like to give you guys a sneak preview and look at this game. So this is a game between myself, I was playing black, and Emily Coles Gilberto, about a 2150 from Spain. Uh, this game was played in 2015. And the start is fairly, fairly normal. We play this opening. What is it called, anybody? What is this opening called? Yeah, Mathematik Chagi, I'm not, not going to comment on that particular question. Ragozin, yeah, so this is a Ragozin, a very, very solid line. Uh, it's, it's not quite the Nimzo. Uh, the Nimzo happens, I know that you guys are not here for a lecture on opening finesse, but just for the sake of completeness, this is the Nimzo after knight c3 bishop b4. And the Rogozin is a little bit different. Now, we started with knight f3, d5. But with the Rogozin, there's already a knight on f3. And there's already a pawn on d5. That's the, that's the main difference. It's a very popular line these days uh, because it's so solid. And in recent years, even top grandmasters have not been able to show too much of an advantage for white here. So I decided to play it. And uh, my opponent plays a3, bishop c3. I'm going to skip fairly quickly past the opening stage of the game. OK, so councils. Queen c8, trying to get my bishop on, on h3, bishop f4, and I played here at c4. So I'd like to focus a little bit on this moment to start. Why did I play c4? Why, why did I make this move? Can somebody, can somebody try to explain that in, you know, using, using words rather than variations? For the outpost, absolutely. So one thing is, 
that's good positional thinking. That's this B3 stronghold is created. And later on, I might be able to bring my knight there via C6 and A5. Um, yes, Sam Smith mentions the weak C3 pawn. I wouldn't really call it weak. Uh, it can really be well defended by, for example, a queen on C1, but absolutely, maybe potentially. Rujong Wong right. Black is an advantage on the light squares on the queen side, and he wants to post a knight on B3. Yeah, that's already been mentioned, absolutely, to control light squares, avoid isolated pawns. All of these are very good thoughts, and all of these factor into my decisions. I mean, my basic idea was this. White has the two bishops advantage, right? And white also has a threat in this position. What is white's threat in this specific position? What is white threatening here? If it were white to move, what would he play? Um, D takes C4, I'm assuming you mean D takes C5? Possibly, but there's a little bit of a more annoying option here for white. Well, rook v1 blunders that rook. There's a bishop on f5 controlling the square. And you guys are missing something. It's, um, it's this concept of tactical awareness, which is another thing that I talk about. It's not D takes C5, although that is a distinct possibility. Well, it's 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 white to move here. We're we're discussing if it were white to move, what would he do? I want to see at least one person. Yeah, chess philosopher, very good. So I was a little bit concerned about bishop d6, which creates. Let me try to skip a move here using my chess based skill. I was a bit concerned about bishop d6, and how scary this is, I'm not sure. After rook e8, he probably won't take with a bishop because of knight e4, but he is going to take with a pawn. And in addition to opening up the center, which is very good for his bishops, he's also snagged upon, at least for the time being. And um, that certainly did not factor into my, my list of desirable things to happen. In addition, as some of you pointed out, um, after bishop f4, he kind of wants to open up the center, okay? And whoops, let me actually skip another move. He wants to open up the center, right? And I think it would make sense that he's got this d4 square, he's got the two bishops, my, king, my queen side's a little bit underdeveloped, and I don't want to allow all this to happen, and so I played c4. And I want you guys to understand one thing as I'm, as I'm describing all of this. You know, you might think of me as a GM, and I hope you think of me as a pretty strong player, but a lot of these things, a lot of the moves that I make, especially with, with regards to positional chess, are not these incredibly mysterious, weird sorts of advances that cannot be explained. As we can see here, the algorithm that I arrived at to find C4 is very, very logical. I think c4 is a very powerful positional move, but I also think that it's easily explainable and it's easily arrived at through a healthy positional train of thought. So that's one thing that I'd like you guys to take to heart from this. So c4 closes up the center. Uh, my opponent plays knight d2. His plan is quite straightforward. He wants to prepare this advance e2, e4, which means that I have to root out some of the pieces that are supporting the e4 square. I played the move bishop h3, forcing the trade of bishops. Rook e1. Now, could somebody tell me, let's say that... I wanted to keep that bishop on h3 and develop my pieces first. What would be the downside of a move like knight c6? Why can't I why can't I maintain that tension with the bishops? Hmm. Not an easy question. Bishop, yes, very good. Bishop, uh, uh, swipey, cool. Bishop a1 would be this move. I'm assuming that's not quite what you meant. You meant bishop h1. That's exactly right. Now, whether or not bishop h1 is that great is another story, but why allow white the opportunity to keep the bishops on the board? So that's why I traded bishops first and played knight c6. My opponent plays the move f3. And here you reach a really important moment, one that I focused on extensively in the Naradinsky method. And I think it speaks very, very well also to Sam Shanklin's kind of general overarching topic of his method, which is once again, using um, calculation and using concrete thinking in order to further positional goals. So White's idea is very clear. He wants to play e2, e4. He wants to blast open my flimsy center, and then he's going to be better. So there are two things that might happen. I can allow him to do that and accept a worse position, or I can hunker down and use my concrete thinking in order to, to try and find a way to block e2, e4 from happening. 
So I'd like to give you guys maybe a minute or two to think about this position with black to move. How did I discourage white from playing e4? Ivan Smisalovich, very good. Knight h5 was the move made. And the point of this move is that after e4, I'm going to hugely cripple white's pawns after knight takes f4 check. I'm hoping this is making sense. And this is probably, in retrospect, what white should have done anyway. Um, I would have made a move like knight e7 here. Now, if I had a choice, I think white may have a slight edge nonetheless. But, um, you know bad pawn structure is better than good pawn structure. So I would have taken this any day over just e4 with that bishop left on the board. But my opponent made this kind of knee-jerk reaction. He played the move bishop e3. And his idea is actually quite healthy. He wants to tuck this bishop away on f2, and then once again, he's going to have this idea of playing e2, e4. So with that in mind, how did I follow up? So white cool, excellent. F5 is in, indeed what I played. Um, establishing the sort of do-it-yourself Marozzi bind on the E4 square. Um, Brandon Villa, uh, rookie it is a thought, but I think it would actually be inaccurate because it basically sends the bishop to F2, and his plan is to play bishop F2 anyway. So that's exactly why I played F5. Again, I'm playing very logically here. I think that I'm outplaying my opponent slowly, and he's no pushover. He's the 21... 64 rated player, but I'm making all of these moves that are very easily explainable and very logical. And that's one of the, the constants in the Naroditsky method. One thing that I try to describe is how to use this sort of logical thinking in order to come up with very powerful moves. So if you're someone who struggles with some of these positional themes and struggles to find your way in these positionally complex situations, then the Naroditsky method is certainly for you. My opponent played the move bishop f2. Now, there's a bit of an issue, as Vadim points out. Um, I, I think that's what you mean. E4 is still kind of a distinct possibility in this position. Uh, given the opportunity, white is, is going to play the move E4. And after F takes E4, F takes E4, to be sure, it's not as bad as as, uh, as E4 immediately. But um, this knight on H5 is also hanging. And after D takes E4, he's just going to pick up that knight. So that would not be a very good outcome for black, which once again leads to the question, well, how does black continue to discourage the movie four? And here is where this concept of calculation comes in. Try to find a concrete tactical idea that discourages the movie to e4. Not an easy idea to find at all, but I think you guys can do it. A couple of you are suggesting f4. Jaden Zhu suggested queen e8. Yurun, um, Yeroon, if you're if you're the Yeroon who organizes Tata Steel, it's an it's an honor to have you here. But I know it's also a pretty popular Dutch name. But uh, a lot of you are suggesting F4, which I think would be a very very instructive positional mistake. Now, in doing this, I I hope that you're not taking this wrong. I really don't mean to to make a point out of asking tough questions and then kind of ridiculing wrong answers. Not at all. I think this is this is really a pleasure for me to see so many ideas being generated. What would be wrong with F4? It looks very very tempting. Hiroon <laughs> says I'm not. Oh, well, um, good to have you here anyway. The reason that f4 uh, would not be as good is actually very interesting. And, and, and this builds on the concept of positional transformations. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play the move g4, all right? I'm assuming that you're going to play knight f6. And I'm going to play e4 anyway. So one of the questions that Sam Shanklin talks about a lot in his, his series is when you have an idea and has prevented it, what happens if you do it anyway? That is the first question that you should be asking yourself. So here we ask ourselves, what if white plays e4 anyway? Is that that good for black? And I think what I found during the game is that if I liquidate to a position like this, I still didn't like it because yes, white does not have a massive pawn center, but he has other positional trumps that he's developed in order to, um, after playing e4. He has a really nice rook on e4 and a pass pawn on d4. I still think black is worse. So uh, Swipey Cool is mentioning on Passan. On Passan will lead to a similar sort of issue after Rook takes e3. I would still, yeah, I understand. I understand. The point is to take on e3, but I, I'm still not the biggest uh, fan of Black's position. Here's what White's plan is going to be. I'm going to play Bishop g3, then I'm going to play Queen e2, and then I'm going to play Rook a to e1, and I still have a very, very nice positional clamp going on. 
Brandon Vila, you're exactly right. I'm not trying to claim that white is winning here. I just think that black hasn't fully solved his problems. And white has a very clear plan, at least from a human perspective, I would definitely prefer white here. But I'm going to give, I'm going to give anybody an opportunity to, dis to disagree because I don't mean to be a dictator here. So why people agree is, yeah, white is better. I think white is a slight edge here. Very good. Um, so F4 doesn't quite do the trick. We need to find a more tactically concrete. Yeah, Ru Zhang Wang, very good. Uh, very good uh, intuition. Black also doesn't have a concrete plan in that position. And when you don't have a concrete plan, that's the precursor to a mistake. So try to come up with a more tactically creative idea, maybe utilizing some of the hidden weaknesses in white's position. Really go deep here. Who am I to disagree with Daniel Nerdisky? No, I welcome, I welcome any and all disagreements. I, I, like all other humans, make a lot of mistakes. So disagreement is the stuff of learning. Gerard Seeley, you're basically right. Um, queen, I'm assuming you mean queen e6 because queens don't move like knights. Um, and Archer Narowski, you have the right idea. You want to basically use that G file. I played the move queen e8 here. Um, just to uh, support that knight, just in case, on h5. Uh, queen e6, I think, would be basically the same thing. And my point is this. My opponent didn't play e4. He played the move e3. But what would have happened if he played e4 anyway? I would have taken on e4. And now which move would I, would I have made here, which, which, which really makes all of the difference? What is the logical follow-up to queen e8? Queen f7, um, I, can, I, can, I can defend that bishop with queen e2. Rook takes f2 doesn't work tactically. Remember that we need to calculate. After king takes f2, you're not going to find a good follow-up. Rui Zhongguang, you're right. Queen g6 is exactly what I had in mind. If he, if he takes d5, what actually almost loses immediately after knight f4 check. And all of a sudden, Vadim, very good too. All of a sudden, Black's develop, Black develops a massive attack. And what I'm using here is this hidden latent weakness along the G file. After King H1, um, I can make a couple of moves. If I'm an old guy, I can just take on D5, and everything collapses. C3 collapses, F2 is under fire, Black has a really nice knight on D5. Nothing remains of White's impressive central pawns. Now, if he does not take on D5, but, I mean, what does he do? Because he can't move the King to H1, because the F2 bishop is going to hang. Defending that f4 square is not very easy. If you play bishop e3, I'm going to gobble up that pawn. Thank you very much. Now, in addition to all of White's other troubles, I have a really nice square in f3. So e4 just isn't possible for a tactical reason. And guys, I want you to understand, it's not about this specific idea. It's about this concept of you have a positional situation. Okay, this is a very positionally rich I wanted to say positionally rich position, but my English teacher would murder me. And yet, we're using concrete tactical thinking and calculation to come up with very, very actionable and strong paths in order to solve the situation, okay? And solve the positional problems um, contained within. And this intertwining of tactical concepts and positional concepts is one of the mainstays of modern chess, understanding it and understanding how tactics and calculation and positional thinking combine, I think, forms one of the... Um, one of the main components of succeeding in this world of modern chess, all right? My opponent played the move e3, covering the f4 square, and here I took the opportunity to play b5, starting some nice queenside pressure. He played queen b1, I defend it with rook b8. And after e4, f takes e4, f takes e4. e4 was actually a mistake. He should have just accepted a worse position. Somebody remind me, what move did I play here? Queen g6, very good. Now, let me take a very annoying one minute break just to mention that a link has been posted in the chat. If you're enjoying this analysis and if you find yourself, yourselves engaged in learning something, then to remind those of you who came late, iChess is offering an incredibly good deal, which is only active for the next six hours or so, getting both the Naraditsky method 
and the Shanklin method, both for $79, when each one of them is worth $120 alone. Um, once again, I always say this, I don't like to be a peddler. If you don't buy it, that's fine. But at least if you're enjoying this and you'd like to learn more about my methods of teaching and 15 more hours of exactly this, engaging analysis, tips, and tricks that are not commonly available in chess literature, get the bundle because Shanklin's method is also excellent. So a link has been posted a couple of times in the chat, and it's just been posted right above. So in any case, moving on, queen g6 is absolutely devastating. Bishop e3 was played. Uh, my opponent, the reason he put his queen on b1 is he wants to keep this e4 pawn defended. And for the last time, I'm going to ask you guys to use your tactical brains to solve um, to solve um, a positional question. White's threat is he takes d5. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So the queens are traded, but white's doing swimmingly. So can you find a really tactically astute way to deal with the threat of e takes d5? No, Rui Zhang Wang. I didn't know Fabiano Caruana made a DD, but I love Fabiano Caruana. But let me just remind you, instruction and chess teaching does not correlate one to one with the rating that you have. Our ratings with Sam are pretty high, but I'd argue that maybe we've also done a little bit more chess teaching than even Fabi has. So that's what I've said. Knight of 4-check is possible as a thought, but after bishop takes c4 and he takes d5, you haven't solved the underlying problem. Oh, you're joking. I didn't know he made it. <laughs> Got me. Ha, ha, ha. See how hard I'm laughing? You're so funny. Ha, 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 ha. So let me, let me set you guys up a little bit. E takes d5 cannot be stopped directly. But what you can do is cure the underlying problem. You can prepare a move such that after e takes d5, you can close off that b1 to g6 diagonal because this is the diagonal that annoys black. I want to keep that queen on g6 as an attacker. Excellent. Only hope you have. Very happy to hear that someone found the move. Knight to e7. And the whole point is that after e takes d5, I have the move knight f5. Now, in addition to the fact that the queens are on the board, I have sacked a pawn. But look at how many pieces I all of a sudden have in the attack. And look at how naked the king is. The game is simply over. There's... The threats are absolutely overwhelming here. So the game ended in just a few moves. After knight f1, the simple move queen g4, knight d2. My opponent is desperately trying to cover all of the weak squares, but after knight h4 check and knight takes g3, everything comes crashing through, and he resigned. Um, yeah, but the e takes d5 was certainly very cooperative. He should not have done that. Uh, having said that, my intention now is to actually take on e4 and um, to play my knight f5 myself. So I think his position was almost beyond salvation at this point. And um, I mean, look, this game lasted just like 25 moves. And I would argue that at no point did I do anything truly extraordinary. I just applied very sound positional and tactical thinking. And in particular, I applied this very, very important technique, which is covered at length, especially in the Shanklin method, of using calculation to further your positional goals, all right? Couple of questions about this game. Vadim suggests knight f3. Uh, at what point, at what point would you like to suggest knight f3? And Anandu a suggests b4. I mean, b4 never really works because this square is very well defended. I'm just going to play a takes b4. Unless you want to troll white, and in a position like this, you play b4, and then you're like, ha ha, I actually know what I'm doing. I'm going to play knight takes g3. But I still consider myself somewhat of a, of a gentleman, so. Wouldn't do that, wouldn't jeopardize my reputation. But uh, yeah, uh, I was really happy to play this game even though I outrated my opponent because I really felt that it it taught me a lot about the power of this sort of combination of tactics and positional chess, all right? Any other questions about this game before we move on, kind of wrap up, and then I open the floor up for general questions? I would play d4 if I was a sadist, says Rui Zhang Wang. Yeah, that's exactly right. But uh, I prefer to win the game early because I'm always hungry. I like to go eat. But anyways, um, we're, uh, thank you, uh, Swipey Cool. Cool game. M many, many games like this and tens and tens of other cool games to be found in both the Nerdiski method and the Shanklin method. 
So in any case, we're running short on time. I don't want to bore you guys with yet another game. Instead, I'd like to just talk for a little bit, quickly summarize what we talked about today, quickly summarize what else you can find in the two methods. And after that, I'll open the floor up for a couple of minutes of question. Gerard Seely asks, where was this played? This, this game was played in the Benasque Open in uh, Benasque, Spain. Um, it's, uh, about four hours from Barcelona. And um, one side note I'll say is that all this really isn't important because when I heard about the, the awful terrorist attack in Barcelona, I, I've, been to, I've been to Barcelona like eight times because I, oh, I play in Spain all the time. So I've been to that particular stretch like five times in my life, Las Ramblas, where the, uh, where the awful attack happened. And so sometimes it's good to remind ourselves of these things because chess is, it's just a game. So throughout my life, I've always taken training and taken chess with a bit of a grain of salt. And that's why the Nerdisky method too, but generally I just like to be lighthearted about things, you know. I think that really, really goes a long way. When you're, uh, when you're having fun when you're training, when you're having fun even when you're making wrong moves, that's really what, what counts, I think, in, in this life. But anyways, to summarize, what we did today was we talked about several concepts that are featured in both the Naroditsky method and the Shanklin method. Um, we started with a couple of tips that I have about calculation. In the Naroditsky method, I talk about calculation for more than an hour, and I give a lot of these lesser-known tips and lesser-known methods that you can use in order to make sense of very tactically complex positions. Because we talk a lot about... Um, we talk a lot about just noticing simple combinations, but how do you stay afloat in these very, very complex situations? I'm going to have to get the Nerditsky method to find out. In the second game between myself and Coles Gilberto, we, um, we talked about a bit of a different twist on calculation, um, how to use calculation and tactical thinking in order to solve positional problems. This is the main overarching theme of the Shanklin method, an incredibly important question. And you're going to have to get the Shanklin method to find out. Wouldn't it be great if you could get the two at the same time? Gee, you actually can. So before I, I make a final sales pitch for, for those of you who have not already purchased the Naroditsky and Shanklin method, uh, I'd like to open the floor up for just a couple of minutes of questions. Uh, let, me, let me transition back to my ugly face so that you guys can, uh, can, in fact, be assured that I exist in this world. So give me a moment. All right. Uh, let's, I know that the screen is really messed up right now, so bear with me. There we go. Okay, so I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking at the chat. Um, fire away with any questions you might have about anything. Naroditsky method, Shanklin method, anything about my chess career. We got about five minutes. All right, let's start taking questions. Um, Afui, thank you for your compliment. Appreciate it. Let's start with uh, Gerard Sili. Did you play Carlos Gascon in Spain? I don't know who that is. I have not. Vadim, I don't like C4. Well, we're going to have to take it up mano a mano. Come over to, um, come over to Stanford in a month, and I'll be glad to uh, take you out for coffee. We can play the position out. I'll play C4. You'll try to beat me with white. Uh, chess philosopher, do you go into evaluation as well? Absolutely. I talk about evaluation a lot. In fact, one very rebellious thing I'll mention, I think that evaluation is one of the most overrated concepts in all of chess. This might sound like a weird statement to you guys. Again, talk about that in a lot more in their disc game method. Brandon Vila, opinions on the Nimzo Larson. I'm assuming you mean 1B3. I think it's a decent move. I haven't played it myself with white. I've played similar, similar lines with knight f3 and b3. But uh, it was played against me by this very, very strong Georgian grandmaster, Badur Jobaba, and he was completely crushing me. So I quite like that move. Chess philosopher, uh, sorry, Martin Orozco, why aren't you a world champion? Great question. Uh, gee, I don't know. I think it's, uh, I went to school my whole life, so chess is something that I dearly, dearly love, but it's not the only thing I dearly, dearly love. So I think that was one of the sacrifices I made. I, there's a lot of other things in life that interest me, and so I think that if I never went to school, I would have probably done better in my chess career, but I'm very happy with the decisions that I've made. All right, a lot of questions, so just bear with me. I'm going to get to all of them. Thanadon kupriya thanon. How to train on calculation? Answer, get the Naroditsky method. I talk about that at length. I give you specific actionable tools for training your calculation on your own. BK, where do you play next? Next, I play in the St. Louis Fall Classic, an invitational tournament with 10 players, 10 grandmasters. That will be held in St. Louis in early September. I just returned from the Washington International Open. I played disastrously. 
one of the worst tournaments of my life, but um, a good learning experience. So chess is all about learning how to take the punches and then punching back. So hopefully I can come back. Ivan Stanislavich, do you think that you can break 2,700? I hope so. That is my ambition. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical, but the fires of ambition are as fiery as ever, even though I'm in college. David Blue, why did you decide a video series was a good way to say that what you wanted to say? Okay, that's a great question. I think that Sam Shanklin, uh, my good friend and author of the Shanklin Method, mentions this a lot. There's a there's a distinction between passive learning and active learning, and ne neither Sam nor I believe in passive learning, which is simply taking something in and expecting it to make a difference. Active learning is the way to go. Active learning means actually listening to something and participating and doing it as you go along. And in both methods, we give you guys plenty of opportunities to pause the video and come up with moves. So it's not just 15 hours, 30 hours actually, of us lecturing at you and expecting you to know everything. We give you opportunities, first of all, tips to train on your own, and second of all, plenty, plenty, plenty of hours where you can set up those positions in the video and actually solve them on your own. Anandu A, which is the best book for a player of rating 2200? Can't tell you too much off the top of my head. Again, see Naroditsky method, but I really like Chess for Zebras by Jonathan Rosen. When is your next tournament? Answer that already. Can you go over the worst opening in the world? No. What do you think the Scandinavian? Dubious. Have you heard that Fisher called E45 King E2 best by test? Fooled me once, shame on me. Fooled me twice, shame on you. Don't fool me. Will you play me at chess.com someday? Arthur Narowski. A few days per move. I'll play you in live chess if you challenge me and find me. Are you going to play more in chess juice soon? Absolutely. As soon as I come back from my hectic summer travels, settle in during the school year, I'll do some more live streaming because I do love Blitz. Daniel, how much of your success is attributed to natural talent? Long answer, can't really say. Probably both talent and work. How should one use your videos to get the best from them? Watch them. Watch them and actually pause them and think about moves when I suggest you to do. Expect that you can fast forward all 30 hours and learn. You'll need to work very hard, but if you do, I can almost guarantee that you'll see very, very serious improvements in your play. Sam Shanklin asked me, Daniel, how are you enjoying North Korea? I'm loving it. Uh, I just went on a tour to uh, some buildings in Pyongyang. It's excellent. As, as you guys know, I'm in North Korea right now. Arthur Machnitsky, the biggest difference is when you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, can't read it right now. We got like two minutes left. How to go from 1600 to higher. Watch both Naroditsky method and Shanklin method. What is my chess.com? Very original name, Daniel Naroditsky. How should one use your videos? Okay, that was already asked. Watch them and buy them, says Sham Shanklin. Very good. Um, and uh, really, it's, it's an investment. Okay, three more questions before I close, because I want to talk a little bit about why you should actually buy them, because that is quite a bit of money. Why is the Scandinavian dubious? Uh, I just think modern theory considers it so. Five minutes, you've been challenged. Do you play on Lee Chess? I do play on Lee Chess. I would not like to reveal my, uh, my account, though, because it is somewhat anonymous. But uh, I think with enough scouting, you guys can figure out. Michael M. Pena asked the most important questions of all. Where do you buy our video series? And with this, I'm going to have to close. Um, so I'm not going to be taking any more questions. But remember that you guys can always find me on chess.com or my Facebook page. But right now, I'd like to close by mentioning one more time the following thing. Um, and give me a moment to find that link. Just give me a second, folks. So why was I doing this? First of all, I love teaching, and it was great answering all of these questions. Jeroen van den Berg, it's Rebecca Harris. I don't know about that. I don't know where he got that information. So there are about six hours left in the sale of the Naroditsky Method and the Shanklin Method bundle. Um, normally the price for the Naroditsky method or the Shanklin method alone is $120. However, for the next six hours, folks, the sale is only available for the next six hours. So just do it and you're not going to feel buyer's remorse. I guarantee it. Uh, what commercial is that from? I guarantee it, that phrase. I think it's men's warehouse. But this is something that you should actually spend your money on. Why so? First of all, it's 30 hours of chess content. It costs $79 to purchase them. Each one alone normally costs $120. $80 is a lot of money to spend. And it is a lot of money to invest in your chess improvement. But the question that I want to ask yourself, that I want you to ask yourself, whether or not you buy this video, and give me just a moment to paste the link to it, 
This is the link to it. It is active for just about the next six hours. The question that I want you guys to ask yourselves at least once is, are you willing to make a very small investment in order to further your chess career? Because I think the reason we're all here is we want to improve our chess. I want to improve your chess, and that's really why I do it, because I learn from you guys. But I do think that you want to improve your chess too. I think that that's why you're here, and that's why you're taking an hour out of a very busy day. The Naroditsky method and the Shanklin method represent our deepest, we put our, we put our heart into it. We put our soul into it. These are 15 hours of top rate instruction. I didn't, pardon my French, I didn't, you know, put in a bunch of crap and I'm trying to sell it. This is primary material, first rate stuff that I really put in a lot of work into. And I'm sure that I say the same about Sam, even though he's not sitting here with me. He left North Korea yesterday. So if you're willing to make that investment, there's no additional equipment necessary to simply very simple media file 30 hours we even tell you exactly where to stop where to think about position and it comes with almost limitless tips that both sam and i give for self-improvement not only for just watching this video but how do you structure your routine as you go along so i want you guys to ask yourself that question are you willing to make a very small investment for your chess improvement and whether or not you buy that buy our package and buy our bundle which is only available for the next six hours I want you guys to ask yourselves that question. With that said, I think that's enough peddling. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's been really a pleasure interacting with you guys. Um, I really hope that I'll be back soon to do more of these webinars. Uh, one last time, I'm going to post the link to the bundle. You're not going to feel buyer's remorse. It's not the kind of thing you're going to click on and say, dang, why did I just spend that money? As Sam reminds me, it's a great deal. It really is. So um, do it, guys. Do it, and you won't regret it. All right. Uh, with that said, um, I have to depart for my for my tour of the North Korean Parliament. But uh, it's really been a pleasure, and uh, I hope to see you guys at chess tournaments. And I wish you guys the best of luck in your chess endeavors. But only, of course, if you buy our bundle. So long.